In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The special joy, that is, the mystery of Christmas, consists neither in the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ is God, nor in the fact that he is man, but that he is God and man at the same time. He is the God-man. It is in this fact that he is God and man at the same time that the dogma of the Incarnation consists, and it is upon this fact that the dogma of the Redemption rests. The Church, consisting of a divine and human element, is but the extension of the God-man. The sacraments, the life-giving rivers of grace, obtain their efficacy from the fact that Christ is at the same time God and man. A priest is a priest because Christ is at the same time both God and man. The Holy Eucharist, which is the body and blood of Christ, is truly and in the strictest sense adorable because Christ is both God and man. <clears throat> Water is able to take away original sin because Christ is at the same time both God and man. And the, the priest is able to consecrate the Holy Eucharist because our blessed Lord is both God and man. Even the state of sanctifying grace in a man or a woman is but a reflection of the Incarnation. The Blessed Virgin Mary is truly the Mother of God because our Lord Jesus Christ is at one and, and the same time God and man. The Incarnation is without a doubt a great tidings of joy. As the angel said to the shepherds, this holy night is the most significant and important moment of human history. And human life will never be the same after this night. Because our blessed Lord has come forth as the God-man from the virginal womb of Mary. Every heresy concerning our Lord Jesus Christ or about his blessed mother is a failure to assert that he is truly and substantially both God and man. Some, unable to believe that God could lower himself in such a way, said that our Lord merely appeared as a man, in the same way that the angel Gabriel appeared as a man to Mary when he announced the Incarnation. Others said that Christ was a mere man who was adopted by God when he was baptized in the Jordan. Others divided Christ by saying that there were two persons in him, one human and divine, and that our Blessed Lady was mother only of the human Christ, but not of the divine Christ. Others confused the two natures, making Christ into a mixture of human and divine, something like a Greek god. Others said that our Lord had no human will, but only a divine will. And yet others asserted that while he was the Son of God, he did not have the same divine nature as God the Father, and was lesser than the Father by nature. These were the principal heresies of the East. In the West, the denial of the Incarnation would take place principally by means of denying its necessary effect, which is sanctifying grace in our souls, the rebuilding of the human soul by the supernatural help of God. Thus some said that grace is not necessary in order that we become like God. Those were the Pelagians. Others said that human nature is so corrupt that it is impossible that grace could ever transform the nature of man into something pleasing to God. 
The first of these heresies, which is the Pelagian heresy, is a subtle denial of the divinity of Christ, for it asserts that man has the power to become like God on his own, without the blood of Christ, without the sacrifice of Christ opening the gates of heaven. The second heresy, which I mentioned, is the Protestant heresy, and is a subtle denial of the sacred humanity of Christ, not of the humanity of Christ, but of his sacred humanity, that is, of his humanity as it is in a hypostatic union with the second person of the Blessed Trinity. As if human flesh could not be sanctified, even by the power of God. The Protestants say we are sinners, human, the human race is just full of sin, and all God does is look the other way when it comes to the redemption. But he knows that we're sinners. He knows that we cannot fulfill the law of God. We cannot keep the Ten Commandments, and he doesn't expect it. He just looks the other way. That's Protestant spirituality, if you want to call it that. Whereas Catholic spirituality is that the soul is graced by God, becomes like God, because it has the life of God in it. And that's why we have saints and that's why they don't. Luther, therefore, characterized our Lord as an adulterer. Imagine. He said that our Lord committed adultery three times. And why is this? Because Christ, for them, has to be a sinner like us. It's a blasphemy, but that's what he said. Failing to believe in the divine power to draw the human nature to himself and not only to sanctify it, but to divinize it, to make it stainless, perfect, and incapable of sin as God did with regard to the human nature of Christ. <coughs> they cannot see a perfect Christ because they are convinced that human, the human race is so full of sin that that could never happen. And that is merely an excuse to go and commit sin. We can't help it, in other words. Consistently, did the Protestants also deny the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist? For if the power of God could not divinize human nature, how could it possibly change bread and wine into the adorable flesh and blood of the God-man? Impossible. Consistently do they deny the Immaculate Conception and the perpetual virginity of Mary. They say that she had other children. And they deny her title as Mother of God. For if the human nature of Christ is not divinized by its union with the second person of the Blessed Trinity, then... Why would she be honored by so great a title as Mother of God? So she's just a nice lady for them. For us, she is the Mother of God, because he is God, and her son is God. It's very simple. Consistently do the Protestants deny the priesthood and the power of the church to teach, to rule, and to sanctify the faithful. For if the flesh of Christ is not divinized, then how could the flesh of mere mortal men be raised to such an honor as to be assisted by the Holy Ghost to teach, rule, and sanctify in the name of Christ? How could that be possible? And so for them, the church is merely a human organization. People who believe get together and form churches, little communities. From the darkness of these heresies and blasphemies, therefore, we see the glory of the Incarnation shining like a bright star in the crisp midnight sky. From this holy mystery of the Incarnation, by which God drew to himself this frail human nature, which had been severely wounded by the sin of Adam, flows everything which is the joy of our lives. 
Our Lord's human nature was not tainted by sin, but nonetheless, he wanted to come and be amongst us and suffer with us, suffer the very things that come to us as a result of original sin. From the incarnation flows the redemption for the sole purpose of this assumption of the human nature by God was in order to use it as an instrument, a tool of the sanctification of men. That's the sole purpose of his coming, and that's why he comes in a stable, to preach already the gospel of suffering for our sins. This sanctification would happen by the sacrifice of his flesh and blood on the cross. This flesh and blood which could pay the price of every human sin for the very fact that it was the flesh and blood of God. For it would not have been able to pay the price if it had not been the flesh and blood of God. For even if every single human being gave up his, his life in payment for sin, it would not be enough to balance the scales of God's justice. It had to come from someone who was both God and man. From the incarnation flow the sacraments. In each sacrament, an ordinary human thing is elevated by the institution and power of Christ so that it may produce a divine effect. Thus, ordinary water washes away human sin, cleanses the human conscience of its black burden of transgression against God, restores joy to the human heart and the hope of eternal life. The creation of a whole galaxy of stars and the vast movements of the universe, all which God created and maintains in creation and moves, all of that, as we look at the majesty and enormity of those things, all of those things do not equal the dignity of this simple act of baptism performed by a simple priest day after day. It does not equal one baptism. The power of God is greater in a baptism in remitting sin than it is in making all of creation the entire universe. From the incarnation flows the state of sanctifying grace. This holy state is a mirror image of the God-man. Where the human nature of Christ is divinized by the grace of being united to the second person of the Blessed Trinity, our natures are divinized by a participation in his holy divine nature by an imitation of his grace of union. The essential difference is that the grace which united his human nature to his divine nature causes his human nature to be truly adorable in the strictest sense. So we bend the knee before the sacred body and blood that is the human nature of our Lord Jesus Christ because it is, it forms the same person as the second person of the Blessed Trinity. There is no human person Christ. There is only a divine person Christ. And his, his human nature has been assumed by the second person of the Blessed Trinity. So, the grace which our souls, uh, by which our souls are united to God, on the other hand, does not make our natures adorable, obviously but simply like God's nature. And we become not natural sons of God, but adopted sons of God. So he sees his own nature, as it were, by participation in us when we are in the state of sanctifying grace. From the incarnation flows the church, which is the mystical body of Christ. As the body of Christ is divinized and adorable, so by imitation is his mystical body, that body of the society of Christ known as the Roman Catholic Church, elevated 
and divinized both by the grace and the authority of Christ in the sacraments and in the jurisdiction of the church. It can thus be called a divine institution because it is a mystical and spiritual extension of the very body of Christ which we adore in the stable of Bethlehem and in the tabernacle of every Catholic altar. From the Incarnation flows the priesthood, for our Lord Jesus Christ is constituted as high priest by the fact that he is both God and man. The priest is the bridge between God and man, and no one could be more a priest than someone who is both God and man at the same time. By divine institution, this priesthood is communicated to men so that we human beings, pitiful in our sinful state, would have the consolation of being alleviated of our ignorance, of our sins, and of our fear of death by the instruction, the rule, and sanctification of priests. What a joy to the world is a sanctified priest. Think of all of the saints in the calendar. So many of them are priests. What a joy to the world, how their legacy lives on and on and on because of the sanctity of their souls as priests. What power he wields against the kingdom of Satan, what a sanctified priest can do to destroy the work of Satan, and how his mere presence breaks the chains of the fear of death of him who is about to go before the judgment seat of God when the priest shows up at your bedside. What a consolation that is. And from the incarnation flows the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is the garden of delights to that soul who loves God. Her very name brings joy to the heart. The image of her virtue and sweetness in our minds is enough to efface all of the disgust of the human sin which is daily before our eyes. Her motherly solicitude is at once the cause of ecstasy to the saint and of solace and refuge to the most depraved sinner. Imagine our world for a moment without the Holy Eucharist, without the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, without the state of grace, without baptism, without the sacrament of penance, without the church, without the priesthood, without the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is a world without joy, a world of despair, a world of perpetual and unredeemed human failure and degradation. It is, in a word, the world that we live every day. The great apostasy from the faith, which we witness with our own eyes, predicted by St. Paul 2,000 years ago, has had the devastating effect of depriving the human race, except for a few small pockets of fidelity, of the Holy Eucharist, of sanctifying grace, of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, of the Sacrament of Penance, of the Church, in a way, of the Priesthood, and of the Blessed Virgin Mary. As much as our Lord came to be God with us, our Emmanuel, which means God with us, our world has become man without God. We have recently seen the Novus Ordo authorize the blessing of sodomitic unions. To what depths will the human race sink? As hunger increases the appetite, and makes us savor our food more than any condiment. So may our Christmas be all the more joyful to us who in this desert of apostasy, hunger and thirst for the joy of being with our God who on this night came to be with us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.